everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. Demons, how do you feel about them? Personally, I'm a bit ambivalent when it comes to demons. I feel I don't know enough about them, as individuals, to speak freely. And what about possession? Across cultures, it can mean different things. And they certainly aren't all negative. Sometimes quite the opposite, acting much like spiritual guides. All in all, I like to keep an open mind. Because some of the stories that are shared with me don't always paint these two in a positive light, while others do. And tonight, you'll hear a few of them too. So, let's get started, shall we? So my girlfriend and I recently started dating. Being young and dumb, we decided to sneak out as much as possible to stargaze. First night was amazing. We found a spot not too far from her house and we hung out and looked at the stars. Second night was different. We went to the exact same spot and everything, just the area felt off and uncomfortable. Then we heard a tapping noise on the back of my car This would remain a constant event, by the way. We decided to go to another spot and see if it was better. After about five minutes of driving, we parked where the cornfield and the forest met. We felt better for about 15 minutes, then decided to chill in the car. After about a minute, the tapping started. We immediately left the area. While looking for our third spot, we noticed a bridge on Google Maps so we went there. Right as we got there, it felt so heavy and so off. I don't know how to explain it. We sat there for about five minutes before I felt this pressure on my head and all of my senses felt dull. That's the best way to describe it. My girlfriend asks if I was okay. I tried saying no, but I couldn't. I said yes without any control. After another couple minutes, there was a loud scratch on the back of my car. I knew it wasn't a branch or anything. There were no trees close enough to hit my car. We shot up and left. I dropped her off at her house and started on my way home. Not even a minute after I dropped her off, she said something grabbed her. She had scratches. I stopped to make sure I didn't need to go help her, and I felt like something was behind my car. I look in my mirrors, and I see this figure. Everything about it looked off, and it was pure white. I looked out my passenger window, and there's another one, looking at me, almost studying me. I sped home that night. The next night, we wanted some answers, so we made a visit to every location. First off was the stargazing spot, then the cornfield, and last, the bridge. The stargazing spot in the cornfield didn't feel as bad as the previous night. Then when we reached the bridge, it was unbearable being there. But I was dead set on getting answers and getting peace with the situation. So being 17 and stupid, I got out of my car. I walked a good few feet in front of the car, and standing in the tree line was my girlfriend. She looked at me dead in the eyes and said, Help me. I stepped forward out of natural instinct. Then I realized a few things. One, my girlfriend was in the car. And two, the thing trying to act like my girlfriend had an unhinged jaw, and the eyes had this cloudy, dead look to them. And three... This one is the worst. There was this big, bony hand on the right shoulder. I ran to my car door and drove off. It's pretty hard to shake me or make me scared, but that turned me into a five-year-old girl. I dropped her off and I went home. She went on vacation, and the temptation to go back there by myself was hard to resist. 
I ended up not going, and I waited for her to get back. So when she got back, we wanted to see each other because, fuck it, why not? Most of the time that we were there was pretty okay. Until about 2.30 a.m., when the cows on a nearby farm started to get a little too noisy. We decided to sit in the car for a bit. So, 3.15 a.m. came around, and it was time to take her home. I dropped her off and continued on my way. I get to the first stop sign, and standing in the middle of the road is my girlfriend. But everything was just off about her. She just looked wrong. And then she said, Help me. I know it's not actually her, so I drive off. As I do, there's this blood-curdling and heart-stopping screech that can be heard. I looked at my phone to see a text from my girlfriend, saying she saw me in her backyard, and I was asking for help. As she's about to run inside, this large, bony hand grabs her head, and she just books it inside her house. So, small update. I was dumb, and I decided to go back to the bridge by myself. When I got there, it felt normal for a few minutes. When out of nowhere, there was this heavy feeling in my chest and my head. I kind of shoved it off, and I didn't think too much about it. The only way I can describe it is that it felt like the muscles in my face started to be pulled off. I realized I had to piss, so I stepped out and walked to the tree line. Right as I finished, I noticed something staring at me. I realized that it looked like my girlfriend. So I called out, Hey, why are you out here? Are you okay? It was at this point I realized that my girlfriend's at her house sleeping, which is a good 15 minutes away. The thing said, help me. I need your help. Her voice was flawless and perfect. I stepped forward out of instinct. When I got within arm's reach, it lunged at me. I blacked out. When I came to, roughly an hour had passed. I didn't know where I was, I checked my phone, and the time read 3.45 a.m. I looked at my Life360 app, and I saw where the bridge was, in my car. I was about a little over a mile away. I'm not in the best shape, but I needed my car. So I ran as hard as I could to get to my car, and I made it there in about 15 minutes. When I got in, I locked the doors and started crying my eyes out for half an hour. I needed to get home, so I pulled out and started my way back. As I reached the stop sign, there was this scream and someone shouting, help, in my girlfriend's voice. I knew it wasn't her. I pulled onto the road and sped home. The entire time, they followed me home and screamed the entire time. I go back there tonight. So when I was about 9 or 10 years old, there was this old asylum tuberculosis hospital that was turned into a hotel. One night, me and my family were taking a trip to another state, but decided to stop for a night at that hotel. Well, once we got settled in our room, my older brother and I decided to stay in our room while our mom and stepdad went to dinner. My older brother was watching TV, and I was playing with my toys or something, when out of nowhere, we heard this loud, blood-chilling scream. It was coming from outside of our room. My brother bolted up and ran to see what it was, and when he opened the door, there was no one in the hall, though the people in the room in front of us also heard it as well. We thought maybe it was just them playing a joke on us. Not even 15 minutes later... We heard it again. This time, the people across from us went to go speak to the manager at the front desk. Just before my brother closed the door, we heard it again. 
It terrified me and my brother, and we decided to call our mom to see where she was. While he was on the phone with her, I was sitting on the bed when I saw a black shadow dart across our room towards the window before disappearing out of it. Later on in life, I learned that a former asylum patient had committed suicide by jumping out of the window. So a few nights ago, I was going to bed while my partner was asleep in the lounge. I tried to wake him up, but he wouldn't, so I just left him, as he looked comfortable anyways. When I went upstairs, I laid in bed on Facebook for about 20 minutes. When I heard footsteps coming up the stairs and into our room, they stopped at the door next to our bed. I looked to the side and saw someone standing there, more like a black figure. It was dark. I couldn't make out any features. Just thinking it was my partner, I looked back at my phone, thinking nothing of it. Now, this is when it freaked me out. I was still thinking it was my partner, and I saw him walk down the hallway. I thought he was going to the bathroom, but then the bathroom door never opened, and I never heard the toilet. When I sat up in bed... I could see straight down the hallway, and it was dark and quiet. At this point, I knew it wasn't my partner, because there's no way he'd be in the bathroom without the lights on. I went back downstairs once I calmed down, and he was still asleep. I made sure I woke him up, and he checked all of the rooms and closets upstairs in case there was an intruder, which wasn't the case. It was so weird. I can't stop thinking about it. And that brings me to tonight. It was less than an hour ago. I was downstairs watching Netflix. Everyone is asleep upstairs. And I'm the only one downstairs. When I hear something in the kitchen. Right next to where I'm sitting. So I walked over to where the sound was coming from. And it was a ball from one of my son's toys. Lightly bouncing. It was one of those small plastic balls, and it made the sound a ball makes when you play table tennis, for example. I just picked it up and put it away. Didn't give it much attention. I checked to see if there was wind, but all the doors and windows were locked. Our house is only a year old, so I don't think a draft would be the case. I'm not too sure, though. I can't help but have the feeling that This is just the start of something. There's no good way to start this story, so I'll just get right into it. Several years ago, I was a pretty different person. I was a thief. A pretty good thief, but a thief nonetheless. I considered stopping for years, but it's easier said than done. At least that's what I told myself for those years. But my petty thieving days came to an end pretty abruptly after this experience. I was freshly 18 and really wanted to pull off a good one. Usually I would check out the classifieds within town to see who had posted for a house sitter, a dog sitter, etc., because I knew that meant the house would be vacant, or at least the owners wouldn't be home. If I ran into a caretaker or somebody at the property, my cover was usually that I did yard work for the family, whose names were fairly easy to locate. I'd never run into a situation where anyone questioned me further, or even questioned my responses. So this house, the situation was slightly different. It sat at the end of the block, tucked behind some trees, and some tall bushes. It was a rental. The man had rented the place out for years. The man I knew. The tenants were changing all the time, though. I'd been scoping out the house for weeks because the latest tenants seemed really flashy, with their cars, their clothes. Everything about them screamed money. Except the house, of course. The house was bigger than most, but 
just as shabby as the others in the neighborhood. These tenants like to party. Loud-ass music, lots of bonfires, lots of drinking. It seemed like the place to be. And then one day, that turned into a few days, no one was around. I watched. No one came in or out of that place for almost five days. I decided it was my time to make a move on the house. After scoping the actual property, I was sure it was safe. I already knew there was no security system because I actually had done yard work for this owner before. When he was getting ready to move in new people or move people out, he'd call my dad who would send me. But aside from that knowledge, there were a couple of windows open. Not the actual window, but the shades were open. The house was absent of all movement and light. Through one window, I could see an Xbox 360. Mind you, this was 2005, and they were fresh on the market. I knew there was no chance in hell that I was going to be getting this for Christmas or anything, so I put it on my mental to-steal list. I continued walking the perimeter, and I got to the back door. To my surprise, it was already ajar enough so that I could actually poke my head and shoulders inside without going in all the way. The house smelled terrible. That was the first sign. First of a few that tried to tell me that this was a bad idea. Setting the smell aside, I walked into the dark house. I was in the dining room. Table set with super fancy dishes, old looking but still new in their condition. Either silver or silver brushed, the chairs themselves seemed to be hand-carved and incredibly heavy-duty, like the table. The house wasn't messy, but it looked like they'd left in a hurry. Possibly there was a fight. Some broken glass. The more I walked through the house, the more I got the vibe that somebody had already been through there. Someone like me. All of the kitchen drawers and cabinets were open in the kitchen and dining room. There were clothes thrown about in the bedrooms, and the drawers were open. But all the electronics were still there. And even the clothes themselves, the really nice ones. People wouldn't have just left those behind. I added them to my two-steel list, and I kept walking through the house. I knew there was a master bedroom on the other side of the house. So I made my way across the living room. As I walked through and looked back at the rooms, forward at the master, and then to the front door, I noticed that each of the bedrooms had a line of salt in front of it, like someone had straight up poured a line at the entrance of each door. Maybe that should have been yet another sign for me to take, telling me I shouldn't be there. I didn't think about it like that, not right away. In fact, I noticed I was careless on my way in, and the lines that were meant for the back door had been disturbed. So, oh well, I thought. The master bedroom door was closed. It felt more like it was stuck. Maybe even locked, but after a couple good slams against it, the door opened. But at the same time, there was a noise from behind me, coming from the bathroom, maybe. It didn't keep happening, but I was sure that it was different, separate, from the sound of me opening the master bedroom door. I made a mental note to hit the bathroom on the way out. But again, I probably should have checked in that moment. All my thoughts, at least productive ones, seized when I actually stepped into the master bedroom. The room was dark, but even without lights, I could see that something was really fucked up about this room. It was absolutely the source of the bad smell. I could clearly see something, many somethings, covering the floors. Carved into the wood floors were random symbols, and there was graffiti all over the walls, the bedding. With the lights on, it just brought the horror to life. It was clear that some sort of ritual took place here. I truly don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to that stuff, but, I mean, symbols, blood, the salt... The circle. Bad stuff everywhere. I started feeling extra creeped out, walking over and around all this shit. But I had to see what was in the bathroom. 
dead animals, or at least parts of them. I couldn't believe I'd gone from designer clothes and Xbox 360 to the dungeon of the devil himself. I left that room so quick. I couldn't tell you what kind of animals because I could hardly believe my eyes and all. But let's just say usual forest critters, raccoon, squirrel tails, and such. This was fucked. Now out of that room, I made my way to the other bathroom. Not to check out things to steal, but because I was literally about to puke everywhere. And I did. But at least I made it into the toilet. I was brought to my feet pretty quickly as I heard the bathroom door slam shut. I grabbed the handle, but it wouldn't budge. My first thought is that it was the landlord. The owner. So I called out his name, saying I got concerned that somebody was hurt inside and that the smell was terrible. No response and the door suddenly opened, making me stammer back a bit. I stepped out a bit hurried, expecting to see someone, but I saw no one. Bathroom door slammed shut behind me, scaring the shit out of me. I probably should have left, but not before I got that Xbox 360, I told myself. You'll die here. A woman's voice had whispered that into my ear. And I don't mean I just heard a whisper. I mean I felt the breath from the whisper. And it was practically in my head. It was so close to my ear. I verbalized a what the fuck and made my way towards the door. Fuck the 360. I was almost to the kitchen when I felt something touch the small of my back. This time, I couldn't turn to look couldn't jump from being startled. I was actually frozen in place. The feeling continued up my back. It felt like fingers just walking up my spine. I imagined myself swinging backwards and knocking whatever it was out. But no matter how much I tried or told my brain to move my body, it didn't work. I could move my eyes, and I was looking in every direction as much as I could. There was nothing there. The creeping continues up my spine, my neck, atop my head. Then the breathing started. Almost a heavy pant in my ear. I could feel the breath, as I felt before with the whisper. It was hot. It was heavy. And it even had a smell accompanying it. The smell was like rotten eggs. It was so overpowering... I thought I might puke again, and just as I was about to, I could move again. The breathing stopped. It was a mad dash toward the back door at that point, and on the way out, I couldn't help but notice that every single cupboard and every single drawer that had been opened minutes ago were now closed. I didn't even bother being discreet on the way out. I honestly may have been screaming or making some sort of noise as I did. The next thing I really remember was sitting on my back steps drinking water. So I sat there for a good while, literally thinking about the choices I'd made, what just happened in there. I had no logical explanation, still don't really, especially for the next part. Because let's just say I hallucinated it all. Highly unlikely, but let's pretend... How does one explain the literal scratches on my back? The ones that went from the small of my back to my neck. They weren't deep, like no blood, but they were absolutely there. Eventually, they faded away. But what didn't fade away was the feeling that the whole experience gave me. Definitely enough to scare me straight, if you will. I never so much as stole a sugar packet after that whole thing. So while I'm pretty sure whatever was in that house was absolutely evil and likely wanted me to die, the lesson I took away from the whole thing is probably what has saved my life. Okay, so me and my boyfriend live together with one roommate. There's five animals in the house. 
two dogs and three cats. Small, unexplainable stuff has happened in the house, such as doors opening by themselves or stuff being out of place. But nothing big before this. There's been three incidents so far. My boyfriend saw it twice, and myself once. We have the kitchen and lounge room right next to each other. The sofa was against the kitchen counter on the other side. My boyfriend was standing in the kitchen and through the window saw one of our dogs outside, standing up behind a small fire pit thing. But a second later, he looked at the couch and saw the same dog asleep, laying on the couch. A few days later, he saw the same thing, but this time with one of our cats, again looking through the kitchen window. The time that I saw something similar goes like this. Two dogs started barking outside at something, really angrily barking, which is unusual. My boyfriend went outside to go check on them. In our room, we have a long, skinny window on top of the wall, which faces the front gate where the dogs were barking. I see another one of our cats, cat number two, walking away towards the garden in our front yard on the other side of the gate. I just assume the cat jumped the gate and the dogs were barking at that. My boyfriend got back inside and I told him it was all good. They were just barking at cat number two. He looked confused and told me that that cat was asleep on the couch inside. I went and looked and yes, she was asleep on the couch. I felt really uneasy after that. Now, before you think it, I know the cat outside was my cat. It had the exact same collar and the exact same coloring and patterns. I know I didn't mistake a stray cat or anything like that. I'm just not sure what it could be at all. We did some small research and thought, maybe skinwalkers? But I honestly have no idea. If anyone has any advice or knows what it could be, please... Let me know. Lately, I've been getting into the habit of reading the latest true ghost stories before going to bed. Yesterday, my wife, seeing me absorbed in these stories before bed, asks me what I was reading. When I explained to her, she says, It reminds me of the story I told you. The one when I was still in high school with my grandmother. I didn't remember her story at all, but she refreshed my memory. And after listening to the story, I asked her if I could share it here, which she accepted. So, some backstory. My wife and I are from the Horn of Africa, and a lot of things that I read are very present in our culture whether it's men and women turning into hyenas at night, people living with spirits surrounding them, etc. I don't believe in these stories, not all of them. Even though I myself have experienced some very strange things. So to tell my wife's story, I'm going to write it in first person because it's more convenient for me. So here it is. I was still in high school at the time, My grandmother often came to visit us at home. As usual, she often came to talk to my mother about things in general. I only remember that every Thursday, she held a kind of coffee ceremony with my mom, which is very common in our culture. Surprisingly, I never asked myself this question before traveling abroad, but it's true. Our coffee ceremonies, not only ours at home, but in our country in general, are very much like a kind of religious ritual. We roast the coffee, we light a lot of incense so the room is filled with smoke, and often we recite prayers. It is often said that it cleanses and purifies the home. That day, I stayed with my grandmother and mother in the room where they were holding the coffee ceremony. I listened to them talk, and out of tiredness, I started to doze off my head resting right next to my grandmother. After a while, my mother and grandmother stopped talking, 
and I felt that something was happening around me. I was wide awake, but I didn't want to show it. I don't know why, but I pretended like I was still asleep. After a while, I heard my grandmother speaking, but it wasn't her. It was a very husky and masculine voice. My grandmother, or whoever had taken her place, greeted my mother. My mother replied with a lot of respect, but above all, a lot of naturalness. At that time, I had problems with my tonsils, and my mother was very worried. She asked the spirit if I was going to recover from my tonsil problems, and the spirit told her not to worry, that everything would be fine. It was strange, my mother addressing my grandmother in the plural, as if she was talking to several people. She spent at least 20 minutes asking all sorts of questions, which my grandmother answered. The spirits possessing my grandmother finally warned my mother that my grandmother was not doing as they commanded and that this is why she was in poor health. They told my mother that my grandmother must never miss the Thursday coffee ceremony or she would have to pay the consequences, which was her health, I guess. After 20 or 30 minutes, my grandmother came to her senses and asked my mother what they said. My mother told her that she had to follow what they told her to do in order to stay healthy. All the while, I was petrified and didn't want to show that I was awake. Okay, so that's my wife's story. I was talking to my wife about this last night. I still say I don't believe in these stories in general, though it is amazing that stories like skinwalkers are so prevalent in our culture. It was common knowledge that a neighbor turned into a hyena some nights, and many other stories about people you meet every day but spend some nights in the middle of wild animals, or people living with spirits, even the spirits manifesting themselves in front of you, etc. Finally, to conclude, I think that what happened with the grandmother in question is a possession that we call czar in our country. Basically, some people live with spirits inside of them that give them orders in order to appease the spirits. For some spirits, it is to read Quranic or biblical verses every night. For others, it is to do coffee ceremonies every week. The most amazing thing about my wife's story is that it is completely integrated into the culture and that people even seek advice from these spirits who possess people. By the way, the funny thing is that my mother is possessed by this type of spirit as well. For her, she also has to organize a coffee ceremony, but only once a year when she makes an animal sacrifice, usually sheep or chicken, and she's dressed entirely in red from dawn to dusk. I know it's super weird, but I come from a very traditional country. For us, it is totally normal. Did you ever have one of those babysitters that just sucked? Yeah, me too. Then I had the literal babysitter from hell and it made my shitty babysitters look like saints. I was about seven or eight. Can't remember if I was going to have my eighth birthday or my ninth, but anyways, I was young. My mom often used whatever babysitter was recommended by her friends or coworkers, very rarely finding someone on her own. Someone without references was a no-go. Now, I will preface this by saying I was definitely one of those kids who hated all babysitters. I always wanted to be with my mom. I wouldn't exactly lie about my babysitters, but I always said I didn't have fun. Even if I did, somehow in my child brain, I thought that if I never had a good time, my mom would just stop sending me to them. Anyways... This is to say that my mom was pretty over my complaints, and she didn't really want to hear how much I didn't like Rose. Because I hadn't even met her yet, I needed to give her a chance. Okay, the story. So yeah, her name was Rose. Kind of an old name for someone who appeared to be younger than my mom. 
She wasn't very warm. I remember my mom telling me that Rose babysat a friend of mine. This was her way of trying to get me to warm up to someone. But I was still a bit disappointed when I found out I was the only kid that Rose would be watching that night. She didn't have any siblings or other kids around, and her apartment wasn't even pet-friendly. After I'd been at the apartment for a while, Rose asked if I wanted to play a game. I, of course, did want to play a game, but was reluctant to do so. But there was something about Rose that made me feel like I actually had to do what she said. So I agreed to playing a game. She smiled. It was the first time I'd seen that from her all night. But it didn't make me feel happy, if that makes sense. It was unsettling, to be truthful. She leaves the main living room and heads into her bedroom. When she reemerges, she's holding a box, some kind of board game that I've never seen before. I read the side of the box, but it doesn't even register, doesn't make sense. I'd never seen this word before. In big letters it read, O-U-I-J-A. What the heck is that? I believe these were my exact words. Rose just looked at me with that same smile, promising me that I would love this game. She cleared off this small table in her living room and placed the board on the table. Then she grabbed this magnifying glass-looking arrow and placed it in the center of the board. I remember I started asking a lot of questions, and instead of yelling at me or even getting annoyed, she simply stared at me, placed a finger over my mouth, while she made a shushing noise. Shh. I stopped asking questions, but then she started asking questions. I almost thought her questions were for me, but they made no sense. Are you here now? Or can you introduce yourself to my new friend? I didn't answer any of these questions. Instead, I stared at the board intently. Then back to Rose. At one point, I tried to move my hands off of the centerpiece thing. But Rose applied pressure to mine, saying very sternly that I couldn't move my hands. I told her I didn't want to play this game anymore. But she wasn't listening to me. Instead, telling me that's not how this game works. She asked the room, the board, I don't know who. Can you show yourself again? And just as she asks this question, I feel my arms being yanked. And I see her arms being yanked as the centerpiece moves rapidly to the word no. She asks this again, and the same thing happens. Except, it doesn't stop after just one. It goes back and forth between yes and no, so quickly that I literally feel like it's rubbing parts of the board off. I remember fighting my grip away from the centerpiece. When it finally released, I was running out of the living room and locking myself in the bathroom. I literally don't remember what happened after that. I must have fallen asleep, passed out, whatever. I don't remember leaving the apartment, but I remember coming to, screaming, screaming that I didn't want to go back, over and over. Then I could hear my mom's voice, and I barely opened my eyes and realized I was in my mom's car. Then I heard her say, ever so calmly, from the driver's seat, We aren't going back there, sweetie. Not ever. As soon as the words resonated, I was fast asleep again. My mom hates this story for obvious reasons, but it is what it is. It happened. And thankfully, she decided not to work overtime that night, even though she planned to ahead of time. She told me later in life that she just had a feeling and decided to leave work and come get me. When I was younger, I told my mom everything that happened, everything I could remember. She believed me, but she tried to tell me that I started having bad nightmares at Rose's house, that Rose wasn't a good fit, other things like that. As an adult, I asked more questions about this experience because I still remembered it differently. 
I figured she would tell me now that I was older. So I asked her one day, what did you walk into that night? Because the last thing I remember is locking myself in the bathroom. That's exactly what I walked into, you being locked in the bathroom. She said Rose answered the door with a literal, oh shit. My mom didn't like that, so she charged through Rose, only to see two other people sitting on the couch, drinking beers, with the Ouija board and paraphernalia spread out on the table. She said she screamed at Rose, asking why she left me in the bathroom. Why didn't she try to unlock it? Grabbing a bobby pin from her hair, my mom popped the lock open in seconds, and she found me sleeping in the bathtub. She said she raised hell on the way out. She was calling the cops, and she was going to sue the shit out of Rose, and if that didn't work, she was going to beat the living shit out of her. The first time my mom told me this, I was like, whoa, mom, that's absolutely insane of you. Then she explained that I didn't see the condition that I was in. Curled into a ball, scratch marks on my hands, shaking. I decided that she wasn't overreacting. In fact, she probably underreacted because she never did press charges. Absolutely slandered Rose's name through town, but didn't press charges. I'm sure there's more to that story than I'm even aware of. Regardless, though, enough to qualify as scary. If the actual babysitter from hell doesn't terrify you, I don't know how a possessed planchette wouldn't. Well, friends, that's all the stories we have for tonight's episode, but be sure to join me every Friday night for more true scary stories. Also, it's almost October 31st, so get ready for an all-new Halloween special this Halloween. And friends, it will be special, so don't miss it. Thank you to everyone who shared their stories and to all of you for listening. Remember, If you love The Darkest Hour and you never want it to end, be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap the notification bell. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda, darkesthour, at gmail.com. Also check out our subreddit and follow The Darkest Hour on Instagram at thedarkesthouryt. Stay spooky.